Welcome to MSM Solutions YouTube channel. Quality systems, quality people. In this video, we'll be talking about reference material, QC standards, your quality control standards or quality control material, or however you name it. First, let's recap on the definitions of a reference material relative to a certified reference material. A reference material is defined as a material sufficiently homogeneous and stable with respect to one or more specified properties which has been established to be fit for its intended use in a measurement process. A certified reference material, a CRM, is defined as a reference material characterized by a metrological valid procedure for one or more specified properties accompanied by a reference material certificate that provides the value of the specified property its associated uncertainty and a statement of metrological traceability. So if you were to buy a CRM, what do you need to look out for to, to support the claim of traceability? As we said, the main difference between the two is metrological traceability with respect to CRM. Okay, what you need to look out for is a clearly defined particular quantity that has been measured a complete description of the measurement system or working standard used to perform the measurement, a stated measurement result or value with a documented uncertainty, a complete specification of the stated reference at the time that it was compared to the measurement system or working standard, an internal measurement assurance program for establishing the status of the measurement system or working standard at all times pertaining to claim of traceability. So remember you need an unbroken chain when it comes to traceability. So you therefore need to see how that traceability has been transferred through. We talk about traceability and when you look at your CRM, you will see that it will say traceability to NIS. NIS is the National Institute of Standards and Technology. So you, at the top we have SI unit, you know, there's international SI unit, which are followed by 22 subunits. You know so in general your SI units you'll have your kilogram your mole your second all the different uh, measurement parameters would have an SI and that will then be subdivided from this you have the National um, Institute of Standards and Technology and from that traceability will then get your calibration labs or your certified uh, producers who would prepare primary standard from these primary standard uh, working standards would be prepared and from that, you would then have your process instrumentation, your, your day to day runnings. So through this link, you would have then your, your traceability. As we've indicated, traceability is not only to NIST, but it's essentially to SI, to a national or international standard. For measurements, you have traceability to BIPM, which is the Bureau of Weights and Measurements. And think about your, your, your mass measurement, right? You weigh a sample you use your balance to weigh the sample. But to ensure you have traceability, you must ensure that your balance has been calibrated by a calibration lab. Right? The mass piece that you are using must also be calibrated by a calibration lab. The calibration lab would use a set that they would have gone um, and also and, and a method you know, traceable to, 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 to their international standard. And these would also be traceable to another. So there will be a chain from BIPM transferring back to your calibration lab and the calibration lab will transfer uh, or tr have that traceability to your, your mass measurement being your balance and your mass piece. And when you look at your calibration certificate, whether it's for your mass piece, you have a balance, you will see there the method that has been used, the set that has been used, and how is that traceable. It will give you a measurement uncertainty as well for each and every particular, either for the range of mass pieces for, or for each range, it will actually give you a, an uncertainty value for it. And that can be traced back. And that's how you then say you've got traceability because when you're now using the same mass pieces that you are aware of its measurement uncertainty, you then put traceability in your, your own system. The easiest and most straightforward way of getting traceability is to use a calibration 
lab, an accredited facility. So it will be accredited calibration laboratory where it provides traceability for your measurement result. Could be calibration lab for your instrument, your measurement instrument, be it your balance or temperature or any other measurement instrument where they can provide traceability to BIM or to NIST or when you're using a certified um, reference material from a accredited producer those would be accredited with 17034 to produce crms however iso iec 17025 2017 clause 6.5.3 also gives reference to traceability by consensus because in this it provides um a bit more leeway that if you cannot get a crm from a 17035 you can therefore you cannot act um be able to demonstrate um, traceability directly to SI unit. You can then demonstrate traceability through an appropriate reference. So what it says that you can still get a CRM from another producer, which may not necessarily be 17034. However, they need to demonstrate that they've used appropriate reference to, 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 to claim metrological traceability. That is, results of reference measurement procedure, specified measure or consensus standards that are clearly described and accepted as providing measurement results fit for their intended use and ensured by suitable comparison. So sometimes you'd have a producer who would produce a standard and send it to as many labs as possible. They will then collect the results and then do statistical data evaluation to come up with consensus values and measurement uncertainty. Uh, for those results then once you have that where they can even show suitable comparisons and how this is supposed to be used and what different methods have been used that went into deriving those consensus then in that way you can still use this because that producer would have demonstrated that they have uh, metrological uh, traceability through this appropriate way of doing things so if it's not from calibration or not from a certified uh, producer you can still get it from a consensus where a standard is pushed around different labs different methods and statistical evaluation of the results are done where you come up with the mean value and its associated measurement uncertainty there are times where you need to use in-house in-house reference material or in-house QC material. So when do these, um, okay, sometimes you don't have a suitable CRM. Remember your CRM must match your samples. It must match the concentration, the matrix and everything. Sometimes there is no suitable for that specific application. So you have to use your own. Or you have a commercially available CRM, but you need to complement it. Maybe in terms of pricing, it's quite expensive. You can't use large quantities. You can therefore maybe use it just once a week or once a month for comparative data. So you therefore use to use an alternative day-to-day uh, -day, uh, QC to complement this one, either very small quantity or very expensive uh, CRM that you have. You therefore need something else to complement it. Or whatever application that you have with the method does not necessarily call for a CRM. You know, you don't need to show traceability or measurement uncertainty for that particular application. Therefore, buying a very expensive uh, CRM is not necessarily the best option for that particular um, method. It's not fit for purpose for what you need to do. Therefore, an in-house uh, produce internally um, material would suffice so then you would use an in-house so it's not always where you can or need to use a CRMs there are instances where an in-house QC can be used however you still need to make sure that it fits the description or it does what it's supposed to do meaning that it must still be homogeneous it must still be stable for a long period of time and there is a preparation guide iso guide 80 which can help you prepare this material to make sure even if you're using it internally and it's your own you still prepare it in the best possible way you know this guide would be used by reference material producers but you can internally use it for your own in-house um, QC material to ensure that you still prepared it the best way to ensure stability and to ensure homogeneity. 
So just a little bit brief look into this ISO guide 80 and the different steps that it has. It has a guidance on how to actually prepare a quality control material. You know, it talks about different steps that you need to consider until the end. So firstly, you look at material specification. The matrix is I've spoken about. What do you want to use this QC for? And it must be similar to your samples within the same concentration range and things like that. You then define, okay, this is what I want to do with it. Then you must go source the bulk. Remember, you want to use it for a long period of time. So you can't just get a small quantity. You need to source the bulk. Once you have the bulk, you need to process it to ensure that it is in the format that you want it. It might be rocks that you need to mill. It might be a wet sample that you need to dry. So all the different stages that you need to go through. It will be milling, drying, mixing, blending. And then once you've got your material in the right form, you then need to package it and subdivide it. You can decide I have 10 kilograms, I'm going to package it in one kilogram things or in 100. But also how you package is just as important. Does it need to store in plastic containers, in paper? You know, the type of caps that you, is, a, is moisture a problem? You know, you then need to decide on how you actually go into package uh, this material to make sure that it's stable for long. From that packaged um, sample, you can then take maybe say 10 aliquots from it, 10 different packs and do homogeneous testing. Remember, you need to prove that your material is homogeneous. If you're going to be using it every day, you want to make sure that every single day you're using exactly the same thing. So you do homogeneous testing, you'll do repeatability test and check and, and, get, and get your results from there. From those numbers, you can also now then assign a value to it. Because remember, you would have analyzed it um, different times and you'll get a consensus value and even be able to create limits from that. Another thing you then do is stability testing. From time to time, maybe after a week, after a month, you'll keep on testing different bottles to see that is this thing stable. You know, once you've got all this information, you need to document that and say, okay, I've got this sample that can be used for a year and any other format of what to do with it, how it was produced, everything will be stored. So you now have a good reference to say, if I use this material, this is what I get from it, this is how it behaves, and everything is documented. Anyone else that comes after to use it will have the information. Another thing is storage. It is very important to state, even in your documents, how this material must be stored to ensure its stability. You know, does it need to be stored in a cool area, in a dark area or what? Or in the fridge at what temperature, you know, humidity? You need to state and make sure that it's stored properly to ensure that it will last for as long as you said it would last. You know, if maybe after opening it, you know, as stability is affected, you need to also state that, that, okay, if a bottle has been opened, it can only be used for so long, but if it's sealed you know we can use it for the for for the longest of time but how you prepare and store it is very 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 important because your storage will definitely affect your stability so all of this can be done internally you can still ensure to give yourself the best possible quality control material in as far as close as possible to how a crm would have been produced you can produce that internally and make sure that you actually have a, a good material with you that you can use for the longest time. So now that we've got this material prepared, what exactly do we use it for? You know, whether it's an internal QC or a CRM. Mostly because we do repetitive test with it. You know, you will use that data to do QC chart, to do trend analysis. You could be using it for comparing results. You could be using it for method development. Remember, you now have a value. On it so if you use it on your method and you get the value out you know that oh okay my method is good but if not then you can tweak your method you know and see what happens instrument performance test if you're looking into your instrument every day and putting this ma material across it you then see how it's performing repeatability and projectability studies remember you're reading this every day you different people are using it and you use this data as part of your method validation as a check sample, even as a blind sample, if you want to make sure that at different times in your lab everything is consistent, you can put this QC material, give it a different name and put it as a blind sample and let it go through the process. And when it comes back, you know what this result is supposed to be. You then compare it and see operator variability. You know, 
different operators operating every shift every day and but they're using one sample and you will then see that okay we're all getting the same result or if this operator is working my results become low or this one high and then you can then you know go and investigate okay what's happening is there a training issue or is there something else you can also assess impact of any changes on the method so you change something including environmental changes and then you see what your results come back as you know so mainly the qc material is there to guide you in your process is there to tell you when things go wrong is there to tell you when something within your method has changed including environmental condition you might find that the instrument cannot operate at high temperatures and you see that by your qc failure that oopsie my qc failed and the one thing i re i realized has changed is room temperature in this room then you know you know okay it means my method can only operate under certain parameters so these are very important aspects of what information this actually gives you you know and we'll dive into more about what to extract from 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 qcs uh, in the next few videos so next up we'll discuss in detail qc charts so the next video will be on qc charts as i said you'll be running this qc every day every batch every shift it's up to you how you run it you have repeatability results reproachability results what then do you do you know how do you draw your chart and what is we talk about trend analysis what do you look out for you know to and what information is that giving thank you for watching let's see you in the next video where we discuss qc charts in more detail